All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back from the break. I wanted to say that uh, my books are back here. And as always, I don't charge for my books at, at a conference. That's called the conference special. <laughs> you don't pay for them. Because I want this information out there. My priority is not to make money. If it was, I would have stayed with the post office 25 years ago. So, but if you want to contribute to the work, I am, I am not on record as ever turning down a contribution. I don't require them. I don't turn them down. That box down there on the table next to the books, if you want to contribute to the books or to my work, you're welcome to do that. But it's not required. It's always my joy to give this stuff out free. I love going to Bible studies. People invite me to talk at their home and they invite some friends and everybody's skeptical. What is this guy going to say? Then they see my books over. Ah, oh, I see. He's a book salesman. They see my books over here. And so they're very skeptical. People are sitting here with their arms crossed. Ready to... As soon as I tell them, I've written books explaining God to you in a simple way, take them. They're, they're free of charge. That changes everything. Paul said we give out the word freely. And the reason I can do that, the reason I can bless people at a home meeting or in the street or somebody who visits my home, I give them my book. The reason I can do that is because you have helped me. You have supported this work. I get emotional about this for 25 years. It's been a freelance, grassroots operation. And because of your generosity and every... Almost everybody I'm looking at here has contributed to this work, not only in encouragement, but giving money to print books, to keep me going, to keep me encouraged, and to keep me able to give books out. And while there, you see the first idiot in heaven over there, and that's the book I really want to get out, because that book contains the evangel, the gospel of Paul, and we know that that window is closing of the uh, an acceptable era of grace. We're in that era, but that window is closing and we need to get this information to as many people as possible. I probably have 200 books here, First Idiot in Heaven. I want every one of them gone at the end of this conference. I want you to take 10. I want you to take 12. I want you to go back home. You don't have to. This is going to earn you points. <laughs> not with me, but with God. Okay? You're not earning points for salvation, but you're becoming a fellow laborer. I want you to take those books, put them places. Put them at the doctor's office. Put them anywhere. Surreptitiously. You don't have to be bold. You don't have to be brave. Slip it out of your purse. Slip it somewhere. <laughs> then it's up to God, right? It's up to God. It's all up to God. Or give it to somebody you know. Give it to a friend, a soon-to-be ex-friend. <laughs> and then you will really be doing well because you'll be suffering evil for the sake of the evangel. And that will have been graciously granted to you. Okay. That's, I've said my piece on that. I'm going to close the curtain here because I'm distracted. It's like seeing the, in the Wizard of Oz, seeing the old man. I didn't mean to make a disparaging comment of it on anybody. There. Do I have a question here before I get started? Oh, there's also a book that you can put your name on. Nancy Holland has put a little notebook there on the right. Write down your name, contact information if you wish to be contacted. And if you don't, put a false phone number on there. And your email address. And your email address. You will not be solicited. Imagine, imagine reading a novel. Imagine reading a novel, a spy novel, from a famous Russian novelist. And it's been translated from Russia into English. And there's a very critical line in this novel, and the line is, and then the spy slipped a key beneath the ambassador's door. It's a critical line in the book. And the author is a Russian. But in the process of translating the book from Russian to English, a translator missed a word. He screwed up one word. It's a word for key. The spy slipped the key underneath the ambassador's door. It so happened, in my analogy here, that the Russian word for key is very close to the English word for elephant. And so in a translation error of epic proportions, instead of making it key in English, it was translated into elephant. And it was printed in all the editions. So when you're reading the English edition of this great novel from this great author who's telling a wonderful story up to that point, you get to the critical point and you read, and then the spy slipped an elephant 
beneath the ambassador's door. And suddenly the whole story becomes nonsense. The whole story becomes foolishness. And you start to wonder why this author ever got famous and how anybody ever read this book. It becomes a cartoon. It becomes a joke. It went from an a, uh, intriguing spy novel into a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, something exactly similar happened in the scriptures when the Bible was translated for the first time from Greek into Latin. The culprit was Jerome. The version was the Vulgate. The year was the 4th century, 300 something or other. And there was a beautiful Greek word that God wrote and that all the uh, writers of the scripture used. And this was the Greek word. I own. Pardon my handwriting. That's a Greek word. And it has to do with period of time. There's a beautiful English equivalent there, eon. That's what it means. It's almost... Ion, eon, ion, eon. It's a perfect translation. That's taking the Russian word for key and translating it key in English. Same thought. However, scriptures got translated from Greek for the first time into Latin, which eventually became the English translation. Something very terrible happened. Jerome, may his soul rest in peace. <laughs> or not. <laughs> he saw this Greek word and he about it. Mark? Yes? You're, you're popping again. You're popping. I'm popping. How about if I said it there? Yeah. All right. He saw this word and he said, I don't know how, I don't know what the thought processes were. I don't know the details of why he turned this word into a Latin word, but here's the Latin word that he turned Ion into. I'm probably not spelling it right. N U M, a turnum, a turnum, a turnum, something like that. It was it's a Latin word, and it was we end up translating that into English, eternity. So a word having to do completely with time in the scriptures was translated eternity, and it took a beautiful story, it took a beautiful account, it took a account of creation, of God's plans, and what God is doing, and it totally threw a wrench into a beautiful spinning machine. And now we have phrases in the scripture such as Matthew 24, 46. And these went away into eternal damnation. And we have a phrase in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. Paul writing, the justice of everlasting extermination from the face of the Lord. This eternum became everlasting. It became eternity. It became forever and ever. All sorts of bad things happened when the beautiful word I own was mistranslated. And now it's very helpful. You can see, I told you that who can straighten that which God has made crooked? Well, the answer is this. God can straighten what he has made crooked. crooked. God purposely saw to the mistranslation of this critical word. And because of this, the doctrine of eternal torment has crept into the world. The entire world, the planet, has become infected by one mistranslation, one word. Critically mistranslated. In fact, translated to the opposite of what it actually means. The word has to do with time, as I'm going to show you. An eon is a period of time. I'm going to show you in this talk and the next talk, God's perfect program in the framework of time. God is working with us through a framework of time. We have no idea what eternity even is. I usually start these conferences a certain way when I talk about the eons. I won't embarrass anyone here, but my first question is usually, raise your hand if you think eternity is a long time. I'll just go ahead and embarrass you. Raise your hand if you think eternity, everybody's going to be hesitating now. You think eternity is a long time, eternity is a long time. Thank you, you're, you're helping me out, I appreciate that. Waylon thinks eternity is a long time. Yes, actually, of course, it's not. Eternity is not a long time, because eternity is the opposite of time. I also ask people, does eternity go on and on and on? Oh yes, eternity goes on. No, it's not. On and on and on is a time. Eternity defies time. We can't even understand it. We don't even know what it is. And I have an amazing thing to tell you about, um, probably a shocking thing to say, is that the scriptures have really nothing to do with eternity. And that's a shock. It was a shock for me when I found out that this God is not telling us about eternal things for the most part. Now, again, this word eon is always a word about time. 
God created time. If God could have a problem at the very beginning of everything, I'm taking you back to the beginning of God. God was all alone in the universe. There was a time when God was all alone. He had no fellowship, no nothing. But he wanted fellowship with other creatures. And God had another problem. John 1.18, God no one has ever seen. God is invisible. No one has ever seen, perceived, or heard God. He's absolutely invisible, inaudible. And so his first creative process, the first thing he created, this sounds was also, this wouldn't go over in a church tomorrow if I said this. He created a son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the son of God. He came out of God. Jesus himself said, I came out of God. John 8.42. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 calls Christ the image of the invisible God. I told you God was invisible. I didn't make it up. That's Paul. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's what we can see. You know, aren't these very simple verses? I came out of God. Jesus Christ is God's Son. He's the image of the invisible God. And then we learn something about Christ. And here's one of those places where the King James Version has obliterated an amazing truth. I'm going to read for you Hebrews uh, chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. That's right before James, right? Okay, there it is. I never saw this until I got the Concordant Version, which by the way, I'm reading from the Concordant Literal New Testament. It consistently translates this word ion, eon, every single time it appears in the scripture. Oh, here's a shock. Nobody's ever heard of eon. What's an eon? Ion. This word eon appears over 170 times in the New Testament. Over 170 times. Who knows that? Nobody knows it. Do you know why? Because Thanks to Jerome, who translated it a turnum, the King James translators, in the esteemed King James Version, they translated this word ion, eternal, twice. They translated age, twice. So they, there are some contexts that forced them to translate it properly. They translated it forever, 27 times. 27 times. They're calling things that God has to do with time, they're saying forever. And I'll just give you the clue right now. Wayland's talking about evil. I'm not going to preempt anything, I don't think, but you talk about the, e the bad things in this life that we don't like. You talk about sin. You talk about death. You talk about evil. All these things. Because of this mistranslation, people think that these things are eternal. There's such a thing as eternal death, eternal torment, eternal evil, eternal sin, eternal pain. But when you find out that all of these things, as part of God's creation, are having to do with eons, then that's what I mean about the one smooth revelation. Then you see God's not a crazy lunatic. He actually makes sense and he's working in an orderly fashion in the realm of time. Okay, Hebrews, by many portions and many modes of old, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God speaking to the fathers in the prophets in the last of these days speaks to us in a son whom he appoints enjoyer of the allotment of all through whom he also makes the eons. Through whom he makes active word, the eons. God, remember, this was the third thing God did. The first thing God did was create Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. And then from then on, Jesus Christ took it from there. And Jesus Christ, the second thing I guess that happened was Jesus Christ created the eons. God made the eons through Christ. Because without time, we got nothing to work with, people. God gave us brains that cannot wrap around the concept of no beginning and no end. We can't even begin to wrap around it. Everything we do has to do with time. You have no idea how enslaved we are to one minute leading to another minute to the passage of time. And this is by design so that we can learn things. Because how can you learn things unless it's in time? I used to be ignorant, now I'm enlightened. That can't happen unless there's progression. Progression can't happen unless there is time. God says, I'm going to create a framework of time. And he said, Jesus, take this. I want you to create the eons. This is what the scripture says. He made the eons through Jesus Christ. So, so the eons were actually made. And it was, became a framework. Well, I love that word framework became a framework on which God hangs everything we go through and on which God hangs every revelation of himself.
this is how I can prove it to you. And this was shown to me in 1982. I met a man who was soon to be my father-in-law. And um, he came up to me very early in my relationship with his daughter. And he says, I got a book to show you. He knew I was interested in God. And he brought a concordance. I didn't even know what a concordance was. And he said, um, I said, well, what's that? It's a concordance. What's a concordance? It lists every single word in the Bible. That seemed improbable to me. I said, come on, every single word. He turned to the word God in the concordance. Flip page after page after page after page after page after page after page. Okay, it's every word in the Bible is in here. Okay, giant book, giant book. And he showed me this word in the Greek. He said, well, there's a word that has been translated eternal, but look what the King James... Look what um, this exposes, this tool exposes how the translations were screwed up, how they took this beautiful word having to do with time and it got totally twisted until people think that death is eternal, that sin is eternal, that torment is eternal. And he showed it to me and I didn't appreciate it at first. I just thought he was an intellectual and he was esoteric information and this is too hard, why are you telling me this? But of course, in a matter of two years, I had looked into that and other things my, the man who was to be my father-in-law also believed that God was the savior of all humanity. That's how I first came to understand this through my, my fiance. I was a Catholic. I came from Canton, Ohio and I was working at a hospital there as an orderly and this woman I took care of, she had, she had cerebral palsy and um, I became friendly. I, I was a fun guy. If you had me taking care of you at the hospital, you had fun. I took care of you. I did things I wasn't supposed to do. I ordered pizzas for you when you're on a bland diet. <laughs> I would wheel you outside when you weren't supposed to go outside. I, I would do things for you. And uh, I, asked if, I asked for nothing in return except the satisfaction, you know. It's happiness and fun and laughter that gets people out of hospitals, not the medicine. Man. So. I met this woman who had cerebral palsy, her name was Anita Watson, and I said, when, I, when you go home, you're such a sweet lady, I was wheeled her around, took her, fed her her food, I'm going to visit you. I hadn't planned on talking about this, but it seems appropriate to review how I got here. And she lived in Alliance, Ohio, which is about a 20 mile drive, and I was good to my word, and I went to visit her, and she had this picture was a portrait over the mantle of this girl and it just looked like some kind of beautiful angel or something and I said the first words that I said when I saw my future wife Marsha I said is she for real that's my cousin my cousin maybe you should write her well maybe I should well I did and I ended up going to visit her I ended up meeting her father and he's the one who dragged this giant book in front of my face unbidden <laughs> it took me two years to make sense of it but now here we are this is the same translating issue that by the way that takes the word hell we were talking about that earlier takes this word hell one English word oh wait a minute Gehenna Greek word Hades Greek word Tartarus Greek word takes them into one lump and puts it all in hell. Three distinct, beautiful words ha having to do with completely distinct, different things. And the King James translators made it all hell. This is an opposite problem with the word ion. Here, we're taking one Greek word and they're changing it into many different English words. Eternal, age, world, course, forever and ever and so this is why we need to be workmen one thing my future father-in-law told me he told me in Hebrews 1 2 that Jesus Christ makes the eons the King James makes that worlds why because it's plural this is the same word that in else other places they translate eternity but here it's pluralized you can't pluralize eternity how, how long is two eternities? It's insane. So they saw the plural and they said, well, we can't make that eternity here, so ah, we better call that a world. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, Paul talks about uh, secrets that were hidden before the eons. Same word, before the eons. Can you imagine a time before eternity? 
before eternity? Not even the King James translators could swallow that monstrosity. So they said, well, here we have to make it age, before the ages began. In Ephesians 2, 7, Paul talks about eons to come. It's not only pluralized there, but it's future, eons to come. What is an eternity to come? Or how about eternities to come? How much nonsense can a person take there? And then 2 Timothy 1.9 is really a doozy. I, I meant to write this down, but 2 Timothy 1.9, oh, before times aeonian. There's a, if you look in that context, 2 Timothy 1.9, Concordance says before times aeonian. In other words, before the aeonian times began. There was a time before the eons were created. We just don't know anything about it much because we can't handle it. We're just dealing with the times that Jesus Christ created, which are eons. That's enough for us. Do you know how the King James translates 2 Timothy 1, 9, or maybe it's the NASB, one of those versions, or maybe it's the NIV, the new inconsistent version. It might be that one. Before times eternal. They actually translate it before times eternal. They not only... Never mind, I can't even have it. I, I tried. I blew a circuit. I can't even understand how you get before plural eternities. Plural eternities is enough for me to blow it. Fuse. Now you're talking about before times eternal, but that's actually in a Bible at the Christian bookstore. Concordance says before times aeonian. This word can also be turned into an adjective. Here's the adjective. Aeonian. This is actually, people say it, I never heard of that word. Look it up in the dictionary. It's actually in the English dictionary. This word's in the English dictionary. This word's in the English dictionary. This is a period of time. This is having to do with that period of time. Just like day and daily, hour and hourly. If you're talking about daily, you're talking about a day. If you're talking about aeonian, you're talking about eons. All this has to do with time. As I've shown you, the word is pluralized. We heard of, hear of times before the eons. And now we have a verse where of Ephesians 2.7, I don't know if I gave you the reference there, eons to come, eons to come. And how's this? This is my, one of my favorites. Luke 20, verses 34 and 35. Jesus talked about those worthy to uh, be accounted worthy for that eon. He talks about this eon and that eon. Substitute eternity. Put that elephant under the door. <laughs> Put the elephant under the door on that verse. This eternity and that eternity. I speak to you words about this eternity. Those worthy to happen upon that eternity. That's if the King James translators would have, and NASB, NIV, all your common English translations, if they had been consistent, they would have translated it eternal across the board. Every single time this word occurs across the board, the concordant and other versions, not just this version, make it either uh, the concordant has eon, uh, Young's literal has age, they make it have to do with time. That's good translating. But you see what happened was the King James guys, they panicked in the context. Because in Romans 16.26, this is what happened, I think, they panicked. In Romans 16.26, they read of the eternal God. Romans 16.26 uses the adjective form. This form is referred to, of, uh, is said to be of God. The Eternal God. So this is what they, this is their thinking. Well, we know God's eternal. We know God has no beginning or end. That's true. So this word, aeonian, that's the Greek word they're actually looking at in the, in the manuscript. Since it's talking about God, we're going to have to make it eternal. Let me present a new thought to you, maybe. Maybe this verse isn't trying to tell us that God is eternal. Maybe Romans 16, 26 is trying to give us new information about God that we didn't have before. Maybe we already know God's eternal. From Psalm 102, 27, your years shall never come to an end. Your years shall have no end. That's how he says it. What? <laughs> Psalm 102, 27? Do I have a, a correction there? Yeah. Wrong verse I'm reference? Reading with you. That, oh, you're reading with me. The Bible talks about God being old. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, when the Bible talks about God having no end, it says He has no end. Right. He said he, there is no end, no end. So that's the closest word we have for eternity. There is not one word in Scripture that speaks of eternity, not one word. You combine words like not end, not death, no end. You know, that's how God does it. He uses two words. He never uses a single word. Now the concordant might seem mysterious to you when I first read this to you, but I want to illuminate for you the glory of just translating and letting the chips fall. Just bring it over, gentlemen. Make it, just look at the word and translate it the same way every time and then step back and see what you've created. Don't try to manhandle it. Don't get your grimy little fingerprints in there trying to interpret it. We don't want interpreters. We'll take care of that when you're done translating. You're translators. Bring it over. So we forced them to bring over the Aeonian God, the time God, the age-lasting God. It's like, oh my, what have we done to poor God? But we're getting new information. Because not only is God the God of who has no beginning and no end, He's the God who's going through time with us. He's an Aeonian God. Isn't that comforting? He's a God of time. He's a God who's with us. He's a God who condescends to talk to us and to de deliberate with us and to really communicate with us in that language of ants. We're ants to God. And so he has to lower himself and it's a figure of speech. Whenever God is talking to humans, it's a figure of speech called condescension. Also anthropomorphia. He's coming across as a man. So we have, he's an Aeonian God. He's a God going through time with us. It's giving us new information besides that which we already had. One, Psalm 102.27 that his years shall never come to an end. Also, they panicked when they found out that the saints are only going to reign, uh, it says, for the eons of the eons. We thought saints were going to reign for eternity. That's in, uh, I believe, Revelation 5.10. Revelation 5.10. I'm going to get into forever and ever later. That is a mess, what they've made of some beautiful <laughs> Greek phrases. But in fact, the saints do not reign forever and ever. Jesus Christ himself doesn't reign forever and ever. Because to say that he reigns forever, these are the passages that are difficult. You say, well, we've got to make this eternal. It talks about the reign of the saints. Isn't that eternal? Where's my eternal life, Martin? Oh, that's a good question. If you're telling me that this concept, this word, never is translated eternity, and Scripture promises me Aeonian life. Did you know that? Scripture does not promise you eternal life. Did you know that? You will not find any phrase in the Scripture that says you have eternal life. Your life is always spoken of as Aeonian. For one thing, for one thing, God is the savior of all humanity. Everybody is going to end up in heaven with God for eternity someday. Other scriptures teach that. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 26 through 28. Colossians 1, 16 through 20, which Wayland read for us. Everybody's going to end up with God. Who is going to live with Christ and God during the eons? Who is going to be alive during the kingdom eon, during the new heavens and the new earth? We have Aeonian life. Do you know where you go to to prove that you live forever? It's one of these things, it's a two-part word. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that uh, this mortal must put on immortality. You know the verse reference, I think. I don't. <laughs> in 1 uh Corinthians 15 we will be roused incorruptible and in verse 53 he says this mortal will put on at the change at the change of our bodies this mortal would put on immortality that's the word right there immortality immortality is a two-part Greek word and it's not this one it's not this one immortality this is a cool word you'll recognize it I think in the English almost it's um a Thanasia. A, this is the Greek word used for immortality. A is the Greek prefix for not. Thanasia is death. Euthanasia, E-U, is the Hebrew, is the Greek prefix for good. Euthanasia, when we kill someone legally because they're sick and old and miserable, it's a good death. Euthanasia. This is not death. A is not. This is not death. When death is eliminated, there's no more question that you live forever. And another passage to back that up with would be 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Paul says that the last enemy is being abolished, death. If you abolish death, then it, it stand, it's, it's a given that everything is alive. I'm a simple guy, that's how I understand it. 
you abolish death, you have nothing but life. And we're also, to make it perfectly clear, we're given immortality. We're giving immortality. Now I'm going to attempt to draw something here, which will be a laughable because I should have signed somebody this because I can't draw. I'm going to attempt to draw a picture of a light bulb. This is going to be bad. This will be bad. I'm just warning you. Here's the bottom of it. I can do that pretty good. This is the light bulb. There it is. You got the power coming in here, power coming out here. And the power comes from a source, uh, the electric center, whatever you call that. Those big giant things that make a lot of noise. Generator. Okay, generator comes here, and the light goes here, and it comes through, and it gets this little tiny filament, right? It's made of tungsten, generally, I think, or something, and then it comes out here, goes down here, out it goes. The whole light bulb, the light comes from this thing. It resists the the tungsten somehow resists the current. The current is flying along here very happily. The tungsten is stubborn. It's you're not going through here so quick. And the light, it resists the electricity, I should say. It resists the e electricity. And so there's, 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 there's friction, and then this causes the glow. This is the light. All right. I'm going to tell you something very shocking now. Is that this scripture, the Old and the New Testaments, lines up with this filament. We are just getting a brief glimpse into a limited period of time called the eons. This is a brief... We think it's huge because we're living through it. Some of us live 80 years or whatever, but we think it's huge. But in the grand scheme of things, we have a time before the eons. I'm going to show you. I'm going to draw you a map in my next talk. And I'm going to show you the eons. I'm going to show you there's five eons. I'm going to show you that there was a time before the eons and that there's something after the eons. I don't know what it is. But there's something after the eons. But all this book concerned with is time. This book concerns time, not eternity. If you throw eternity into this book, you wreck the whole thing. You wreck it. You put the elephant under the door instead of the key. You see, you wreck it. You have a beautiful revelation of what God's going to do in time. And you see how he's using uh, evil and he's using death and he's using sin. If you think these things are eternal, I don't know how you sleep at night. You have to ignore what you believe. If you think death is eternal, but we have to, Martin, because God says our life's eternal. So all these other things have to be eternal because he uses the same word. In fact, in Matthew 25, 46, the same word is used, and these shall go into everlasting life, but the wicked into everlasting punishment. The same word is used to describe the life of the wicked and the life of those who are chosen. So what do I do with this? You just translate the word consistently and we'll figure it out. Aeonian life, Aeonian chastisement. Well, that means my life is limited. No, your Aeonian life is limited. But when the eons are done, does that mean you die? I propose this to you. If you have enough water to make it to a well, do you die of thirst? No? If you have enough... Oh. If you have enough life to make it to a time when there's nothing but life, do you die? There is a time where Paul says that God is going to abolish death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Death is abolished at the end of the eons. Death is abolished. Here's the eons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Aeonian describes the life of people who lived during this time. At the end of the eons, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, God will abolish death. At that time, there's nothing but life. Everything is alive. Everybody is alive from this time forward. The question is, who has enough life to make it to the time when there's nothing but life? I kind of sounded like George Carlin there. <laughs> who has enough time to make it through life when there's nothing but life? It's right. When you translate this thing consistently, then you realize that nobody's getting ripped off here. This is special. Just like God is called the Aeonian God, we're giving you new information. Guess what? You have more life than people who simply come alive at this point. You have Aeonian life. That's a special nomination. That's a special name. That's a special category of life. It describes the life of people who live with God in the two oncoming eons and <coughs> become fellow laborers, if you can believe this, with God and Christ in the reconciliation of the universe. And I'm going to talk about this on Sunday. I'm going to talk about the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to open up for you the secret of Ephesians. I know what we're going to be doing <coughs> in heaven. 